be welcome. <laughs> All right. Well, um, I don't want to take up any more time. I want to make sure that folks get a chance to, to hear what you have to say today, um, talking over the science. So if you want to bring up your slides and put those into present mode, I will then uh, bring those onto the screen. And it looks like you are in present mode. So I'm going to bring up your slides and I'm going to disappear. And uh, Richard, take it away. Uh, good afternoon and uh, greetings from Texas. It's indeed a pleasure to present results from the grazing research we've been conducting over a number of decades. And I thank you very much for the invitation. In many of our papers, we use the term adaptive multi paddock or AMP grazing. I want to assure the, the listeners that this is entirely synonymous with holistic plan grazing. And we've uh, used AMP because it um, gets less vitriol from the scientific community. So that's the only reason we've done that. It's well known that carbon rich soil is beneficial for the entire ecosystem. And our goal in our research has been to restore soil carbon and ecological function, the delivery of ecosystem goods and services, and improve farmer livelihoods and social resistance. Resilience, should I say. So when we began, the first thing we did was go to the NRCS who does the mapping right around the US. And uh, we approached the people in Texas and asked them, please introduce us to the ranchers who have the highest soil organic carbon that you have encountered. And without exception, the highest organic carbon wherever we looked was with holistic plan grazing. And that, that kicked us off into having that as the focus to see how well it performed versus the, the, uh, the uh, kind of grazing that people generally practiced. So I just want to begin by saying that many scientists around the world think that we are untruthful or totally biased in our research. Uh, but I want to show you that the reason why we have achieved different results from most um, scientists. Carbon levels prior to the Europeans coming to the US were very high. And after conventional grazing began, uh, organic carbon quickly uh, declined, um, as did the functional effectiveness of, of the ecosystems. And it was only generally about 30 years ago when regenerative grazing began with holistic management, basically, and other similar ones, that in fact we saw a significant actually improvement. Most researchers have worked on areas that have not been subject to regenerative grazing. So they have not recorded carbon, in de they have only recorded uh, in degraded situations, and then they've only measured to about 30 centimeters one foot. Consequently, they have not determined the amount of carbon that can be fixed with improved grazing. Our research has been conducted on ranches where the regenerative grazing has been conducted for 20 to 30 years generally. And we've always also measured to one meter in depth where we can and not just to eight inches or a foot um, when, in most scientific studies. And this gives us a much better idea of the amount of carbon that's in the ground. And this is why our results differ uh, so substantially from those elsewhere. So in rangelands, as in most of agriculture, the biggest limiting factor of rangelands is not the amount of rain you get, but the amount of water that actually enters the soil. On the right is a picture on the ranch that was taken on the left-hand side um, after it had been uh, managed with holistic plan grazing for 15 to 20 years. And on the left side, with, with very little vegetation because of constant grazing pressure, um, you had a lot of water runoff, erosion, etc., and very little function of the ecosystem. And that has changed radically just due to the holistic plan grazing management. Now, 90% of the soil function is mediated by microbes. And the microbes depend on the plants, and the plants depend on the microbes. So how we manage the plants is absolutely critical. And that's at the center of how to use holistic 
planned grazing uh, principles to make it work well. To make a system work as well as it can, we have to make every management decision improve four key ecological functions. Those are the four up there. First, you need to capture energy that drives the system. That's a fuel that drives it. Um, we also have to make sure that water is getting in the ground so the plants can actually function and the soil can function. And we have to maintain mineral cycling at high levels so that the limited number of nutrients in the ecosystem can actually recycle and perform their functions again and again. And to do that, we have to manage so that the right plants uh, perform the, the community dynamics that creates this functioning ecosystem. So the microbes and fungi are absolutely essential to, first of all, soil structure uh, to allow water to get in the ground, improve the nutrient access for plants, extend root volume and depth, and produce exudates, increase water and nutrient retention, and plant growth is the highest when you've got a very high level of fungi in the soil because they perform so many positive things. And they fend off pests and pathogens. It's quite easy to manage in a way that destroys all these functions, but by making sure that they work properly, uh, you, you result in very high levels of productivity. Another great friend of ours is the earthworm. They're amongst our most beneficial organisms. They provide soil channels that enhance water infiltration. And the best fertilizer in the world is worm, earthworm feces. And we need to manage to make them thrive and you need to cover the soil and make sure um, the, the, the soil microbial population is functioning and there's organic matter for them to feed on. Similarly, dung beetles are an absolute key for improving infiltration, facilitating other soil microbes, and in recycling nutrients and decreasing insects that bother uh, the livestock. And much of the research that I've outlined there covers this extremely well and is included in many of our publications. 200 cows can drop 25 tons of dung a week and increase infiltration by 130%. And by concentrating the animals, you allow the dung beetles to concentrate um, on the, the recently deposited dung and then move around after the cattle to keep the thing going much as they would have done in the evolving ecosystems under bison, etc. So let us look now at the a, a, a situation, 3,000 acres here in Texas, and the green dots are um, GPS points of cattle grazing through the year. And you'll notice that they don't spread evenly. They overuse certain areas and underuse others. Um, and they create damage in certain areas and decrease ecosystem function in others. Research is generally conducted on much smaller um, acreages than uh, is uh, found on most commercial ranches, judged by these yellow squares. And no matter how many or where you put those squares, you are not going to pick up the true impacts of the effect uh, in, in the, uh, over the landscape. So under continuous grazing on the light continuous, you see left, plants are selected and overused so they have shallow roots and other plants next to them are underused so they shade out the grasses. And this has negative consequences. If you do that for long enough, the situation on the right uh, becomes to, into play where what used to be short grass after a drought with no roots or shallow roots, uh, they become bare ground. And slowly the process of increasing bare ground increases, decreasing the overall area. So holistic plan grazing, <clears throat> we put in adequate water points so that you get a general uh, grazing right over the whole area. You split the area into many small paddocks and you graze one at a time, the right amount for the purposes at hand and situation so that you don't overgraze at any particular time and you allow a suitable recovery, a long period of recovery um, before the next grazing. And this allows the animals to select more of the whole landscape evening out the grazing pressure and allowing um, recovery after the um, each defoliation and a much wider variety of plant species 
is um, consumed. So <clears throat> an example is provided by early work done at the Nobel Foundation in southern Oklahoma on, on uh, tall grass prairie that indicates what can be achieved at low cost with huge benefits. Project started with a farm having moderately graded native grazing land and few good species with a lot of weeds. You can see a couple of taller grasses in there, beneficials, but a lot of ragweed and stuff like that that doesn't materially uh, add to um, productivity, uh, particularly under low density grazing. What they did is they provided this, a water point and divided it into 18 paddocks and grazed each paddock to improve the plant species, a light to moderate use and not regrazing until recovery had taken place. The net effect, the net effect was that from 1988 to 97, you got a huge number of uh, increase in the number of unit grazing days as the plant population increased. There's a couple of dips in there that uh, happens in, in the normal uh, cycle of, of droughts and, and rainy seasons. But generally over that period, there's very nearly a fourfold increase in a uh, number of animals that can be carried with correct level of grazing. So <clears throat> this was actually achieved by holistic plan grazing, uh, which aims to improve ecological function as the basis to increase profits. So you need flexible stocking to match forage availability and animal numbers, spread the grazing over the whole ranch, <clears throat> defoliate moderately in the growing season so that you don't diminish the ability of plants to produce, use short grazing periods that are good for cattle and for the uh, plants to recover, and then very importantly allow adequate recovery before regrazing. And these need to be adjusted as forage growth rates change. You have to slow things down when things growth is slow and speed things up when they uh, are not. So let's look at the causal mechanisms, and these are what we hypothesized would actually be the case. And this is the foundation of the hypothesis that we were testing in all our research. If you take holistic plant grazing, light continuous, heavy continuous, and no grazing, and you look bottom left at energy flow, water cycle, mineral cycle, and soil plant diversity, holistic plant grazing is good in every single one of those. Light continuous grazing, is low on light, uh, not too bad on some other things, but your mineral cycling diminishes rapidly. No grazing causes many problems because by not grazing at all, you are actually eliminating many of the functions of the, this evolved uh, grazing ecosystem. So just to summarize that, <clears throat> if you look at each one, energy flow, HPG, by far the superior. The hydrological function, very, very high um, on HPG and um, also high on no grazing. With mineral cycling, the only thing it was really high is holistic plan grazing, low on the continuous grazing and extremely low on uh, the no grazing situation. And in terms of community dynamics to support function, holistic plan grazing, the highest by far, moderate on moderate continuous, poor and very poor on the other two. And that basically sums up, and we've been testing those hypotheses and found them to be correct in all our research. So <clears throat> we then started a re research at uh, three contiguous counties in North Texas on, on Southern Tallgrass Prairie. And um, we compared heavy continuous grazing with light continuous grazing and holistic plan grazing. The HPG gave three tons carbon per hectare per year more a sequestering than the usual heavy continuous grazing. We improved soil microbe composition, um, the water and soil fertility improved with HPG, and we improved plant species uh, composition and production. And livestock production was greatly increased. It's quite odd when you go to each one of these ranches you would see on the holistic plan grazing far more grass than on the, any of the other treatments, and yet they had double or triple the, the number of stock there. 
So a testimony to how successful it was. So on the strength of this, those are our results there in North Texas. We wanted to see what happens further north, um, where it is cooler and drier, uh, to the west, uh, where it's uh, much drier, and then to the east, um, where it's much wetter and warmer. So the, the results we got from our first initial um, uh, conceptual examination was similar result, just a little bit less up in the north than, than we, we are. Um, in the dry country, uh, New Mexico, substantially less as you'd expect from a very much drier and slightly cooler environment. Um, so you get less there, but the same things were happening. And then uh, later studies, we've been uh, working across the uh, Mississippi and three studies, um, Alan Williams, Megan Machmuller and Sam Mosier just recently published uh, extraordinary amounts of extra carbon over the, 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 uh, the neighbors uh, that we measured. So because this is uh, not an exact measurement, it, we've, we've uh, assumed a, a time difference and that the, two, the neighbor and, and holistic plant grazing places were, were similar before we started. We, we used a more sophisticated CO2 isotope sampling to determine the exact amounts of carbon being, fixed, uh, being fixed uh, at any particular time. And similar, very similar results we got there. We found out that three tons per hectare uh, with those instantaneous measurements, confirming uh, the rest of our study. So on the strength of that, we um, got some substantial funding um, from both the, the government and matched with um, from uh, McDonald's to do a much more in-depth study with more disciplines, 14 disciplines and a team of 20 scientists. First down on the bottom right in the southeast, you'll see the locations there, Tennessee, sorry, Kentucky, Tennessee, North Alabama, Mid Alabama and then Mississippi, and we measured all of these things with, with a group of scientists, and we've had excellent results. So, the most recent things and and the prime thing that we were looking at is to see um, what effects on the soil organic carbon and soil nitrogen stocks were building up in those uh, five locations in, in uh, east of the Mississippi. So on the left hand side, there's a grazing type, AMP or HPG versus CG in red. And you'll see that the carbon stocks were much higher after just seven years um, of HPG grazing. And even though the AMP grazers had no additions of inorganic fertilizers and the, the, the uh, regular grazing of the neighbor uh, did add uh, amounts of nitrogen and phosphorus, you will see that the amount of nitrogen available in the soil was still high with AMP. And we believe that is because we restored the, the biological uh, production of, of the fertility. Um, so everything was working substantially better. Oh, let me go back one. So at the bottom there, you'll see that the very important thing is the long-term fraction, M-A-O-M, was greater at all depths with holistic plant grazing. So that's this is a very substantial and sustainable uh, productivity. So Alan Williams, in his various um, partners that he's worked with, also east of the Mississippi, you'll see all the states there. Um, and then year one, they implemented uh, holistic plan grazing and then followed it each year uh, for five years. Now you'll see they all started off at a different uh, point, but there's a remarkable similarity in the rate of gain of the organic carbon um, after the, the, um, the beginning of holistic plan grazing. And it's quite interesting that the mean for the top eight inches um, indicated an increase of 8.6 tons of carbon per year relative to where they started. And as we, as I said earlier, my earlier slide, um, 
if you measured uh, to a greater depth, you almost certainly would have recorded a greater amount of total carbon stock additions. So the other thing that's really important is, is the biology is driving what's going on. And uh, Alan Williams and his, and his people sampling, they recorded compared to year one um, and year five, the microbial biomass increased remarkably. And this is the driver of the uh, improvements that, that we have measured. Now, the key thing uh, on in all of these places is the infiltration of heavy continuous grazing versus holistic plant grazing. And these are from up at the, north, the Northern Great Plains and into Canada work that we were doing. And you'll see with only two exceptions, uh, the, the HPG uh, had substantially higher infiltration rates. The other two, the Holtman Ranch was very, very dry, had been dry for many years. So there was a, a more limited uh, response. And on the Cross Ranch, they were particularly permeable soils. So um, even the, the, the poor grazing had not diminished the amount of infiltration that, was, uh, that had, had occurred. So coming now to the, um, to the larger watershed uh, scale, this is, this is a, uh, a watershed that's been um, monitored in, you see the bottom right there, in Denton, uh, North Texas. Um, and you'll see over 100 miles uh, distance, the size of, of the, uh, the area. The, the dark green is uh, native grazing. The yellow is uh, winter wheat that is grazed. And the dark green is uh, native uh, woodland forest. So we had um, the numbers of stock available from 1980 to 2013 on every single farm in that catchment area. And we, we tested the watershed model that they had against the amount of runoff and uh, amount of uh, soil carbon and nitrogen coming into the water stream and phosphorus coming into the water stream as measured in Denton. And the results showed that HC on the left, heavy continuous, the surface runoff was very high. The light continuous was a bit lower, uh, the losses. Uh, the holistic plan grazing and the grazing exclosure were no different from each other. So the HPG, even though it carried more animals, it was still functioning um, as well as the ungrazed areas from a watershed point of view, runoff. And then the infiltration was the exact converse of that. Um, HC the lowest uh, and the HPG and the exclosure uh, being the highest. Then looking at the nitrogen loads, uh, the baseline, comparing against the, 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 the four different treatments, and you'll see the HPG and, and the it, it, Exclosures were much higher than uh, than the other treatments, and phosphorus. Sorry, let me go back. Phosphorus actually uh, showed exactly the same response. So one of the things that we're very concerned about, because everybody attacks cattle, uh, that are the major tool to to get HPG working well to restore uh, ecosystem services, is the emissions. Um, due to the cows, due to the rumen uh, function. So what we, we did was we measured the amount of sequestration that had taken place in HC, LC, and HPG. The emissions by the cattle are in red, and you'll see LC at lower stocking is lower than the other two, which were at the, about the same level. And the green is the amount that, was, that we measured that was sequestered uh, in the soil. And you'll see that all of them have a sequestered amount that substantially is greater than the amount that's that's emitted and sub subsequent work in the northern great plains has just backed that up so the other work done is um many many um feedlot people maintain that that feeding cattle uh, in the feedlots makes for more efficiency because uh, cattle are on the land for a shorter period of time before they go for harvesting so on the left hand side there we've got but, but most people forget to take into account the amount that the well-managed grassland is actually sequestering. On the left, it shows the, um, 
the the soil carbon flux uh, without taking into account the amount that's sequestered and you'll see that it, indeed what, what the the feedlot people maintain is that the the carbon footprint is lower with a feedlot cattle but as soon as you look at the offset of the amount that's sequestered with those two things exactly the, the reverse takes place and you've got a very substantial negative carbon footprint um, when you take into account the, the amount that is sequestered. So this doesn't just have applicability to grazing lands and, and range lands. The people like uh, Gabe Brown who've, who've incorporated holistic planned grazing into their crop rotations um, has come up with very similar results. So tillage on its own in, in cropping systems creates a very negative uh, soil uh, function situation. Moving to no-till improves it substantially. No-till with crop uh, diversity um, actually improves things more. And then no-till with high, higher crop diversity involving many more species improves it substantially again, all because of the positive effects on the soil microbial function. And by having no-till and high crop diversity with mixed cover crops, which are very, very um, potent in terms of improving uh, soil function. And then when you add holistically planned grazing to that whole mix, everything just jumps up much more because the cattle just have a, a very uh, potent uh, positive effect on improving the soil function if they are managed appropriately. So in summary, our HPG or AMP versus continuous grazing shows adaptive stocking is less sensitive to heavy stocking than fixed stocking. As the number of paddocks is increased, stocking rates can be increased while improving ecological function because you decrease, you can decrease the amount of grazing time and increase the amount of recovery time. And that combination is particularly effective. Holistic plan grazing ad advantage over continuous grazing um, increases with a greater number of, of uh, stock numbers uh, as the stock numbers increase and paddock numbers increase for the very same reasons. Short grazing periods and long recovery with greater than 30, 30 paddocks per, uh, per herd allows much higher stocking rates that gives maximum regeneration of ecological function. And we've we found that this is true everywhere we've measured it and also gives higher net returns with much lower income variability. And income variability is one of the main things that uh, hurts farmers. Uh, if you can diminish the, the variability from year to year, uh, you've got a much more stable uh, economic situation. One of the things we found, which we suspected and have hypothesized, is that net profits are proportional to the soil carbon levels and the soil health and soil function. If you manage to improve your soil function, you are going to improve your profits, all other things being equal. So to conclude, holistic plan grazing builds soil carbon and microbial function, enhances water water infiltration and retention, it builds soil fertility, controls erosion more effectively, enhances watershed hydrological function, improves livestock production and economic returns while improving the resource space, enhances wildlife and biodiversity enormously with many, many benefits uh, that I haven't even mentioned, but uh, they are real. And it also increases soils as a net greenhouse gas sink, primarily due to repairing the water cycle um, since the amount of gaseous water vapor is 90% of the heating effect of greenhouse gases. And that is improved vastly by improving the amount of soil carbon. We have many friends uh, in many different organizations that have helped us with this. And I thank you very much. And I uh, would, would be glad to help answer any questions you may have. Thank you. 
Uh, Richard, thank you so much. Um, really great to to see that all laid out. You know, I think one of the the pieces that a lot of us in this space get a lot of the time is for some reason people asking where is the science um, and it should be obvious there is a lot of science. I, you know, I often wonder if it's because people are, you know, uh, searching online and, and in the journals for, you know, the term holistic management versus the term um, that you and your colleagues use when publishing, uh, as you mentioned, which is uh, adaptive multi paddock grazing. Um, but, um, you know, just to, to show folks a little bit, you know, if they are interested in finding more of your research, and we'll get to these questions here in just one second. Um, if you are interested in learning more about Richard's work, um, Savory has a science library. If you go to savory.global slash science dash library, um, you'll be able to go here and, you know, you can search for holistic planned grazing. This will show most of Richard's work. Um, you can search other categories. You could also just search Teague. Um, and search here and and everything will pop up so um anyways i will stop sharing that but now i think let's dive into the questions um i will say that uh, during the presentation we had an issue with youtube for some reason i think our youtube uh, stream got cut out there was some sort of connection what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn the chat on and cross my fingers that it works, that the chats from YouTube and Facebook will show up on the screen. So 